Good afternoon. We're investigating creationism versus evolution. We're looking at paleontology, huge subject. Let's take a look at K, file K33. We left off at one prominent geologist says, because of the sterility of its concepts, historical geology, which includes paleontology and stratigraphy, has become static and unre unreproductive. Current methods of delimiting intervals of time, which are the fundamental units of historical geology and of establishing chronology, are of dubious validity. And these methods used at the time of this quotation in 1948 are still used today and taught in our classrooms. Worse than that, the criteria of correlation, the attempt to equate in time or synchronize the geological history of one area with that of another, which almost always has, they have irreconcilable differences, are logically vulnerable because of that. The findings of historical geology are suspect because the principles upon which they are based are either inadequate, in which case they should be reformulated, or false, in which case they should be discarded. Most of us refuse to discard or reformulate, and the result is the present deplorable state of our discipline. When a fossil is found in a stratum to which it theoretically does not belong, several means of explaining the discrepancy are possible. If it is supposed to be older than the containing bed, it can be said to have been redeposited from an earlier eroded deposit, or to indicate the survival of its particular species longer than it had been previously believed. If it is supposed to be younger than its stratum, it can be taken, again, explained as due to the reworking and mixing of two originally distinct deposits, or else as showing that the animal dates from their earlier antiquity and then previously thought. Often, discovery of such an anomalous fossil has been deemed sufficient justification for redating the entire formation to conform to the supposed age of the particular fossil. With so many speculative devices conveniently at hand for reconciling these discrepancies, it is possible that all but the most flagrant cases of dislocation can be quickly and easily explained and covered up, or, or covered up. In such a manner, it is still possible to ignore them on the assumption that there must have been some mistake in the field evidence or its description. But there's just too many to do that. When an entire formation seems out of place in the standard sequence, on the basis of either lithographic or paleontologic evidence, it is not so easy to dis explain the, the uh, conceive explanatory mechanisms. A little too complicated. However, as we have seen, these cases are usually handled in terms of supposed great earth movements, faulting, folding, thrusting, whether or not there is any actual evidence of such movement. As already noted, systems of rocks are quite often found with the intervening systems omitted. Even more paradoxically, formations are often found actually in reverse order, with presumed older rocks lying on top of younger rocks. In the first case, the missing rocks are falsely accounted for as periods of erosion, and the second, the theory of the thrust fault is commonly and erroneously advanced, according to which rocks originally were flat-lying and contiguous, i.e. touching. They were suddenly separated by a vertical or sloping fault, the rock on one side of the fault rising with respect to those on the other. Then the upper rocks were thrust horizontally over the lower. In time, the top layers were eroded away, leaving then the only the older rocks on the bottom of the faulted portion resting on top of the younger rocks over which they were supposed to move. Often this process would require more force in one place than is known possible. There has also never been found any evidence of the exertion of such gigantic forces such as ground down rock pieces all along where the force was exerted to move gigantic mountain-sized sections of rock. As we have already pointed out, in such phenomena as this has ever taken place on the earth, it is thereby proved that the principle of uniformity is invalid as a guiding geologic principle since there, is no, there are no demonstrably com comparable phenomena now occurring. But on the other hand, is it not possible that all of the many paradoxes and exceptions with which the geological formations abound can be better explained by means of some other principle than that of uniformity and evolution? 
Except for these philosophies, there is no reason to be greatly surprised when fossil is out, found out of place or even when an entire formation is out of place. The concept of catastrophe, which we have already seen to be necessary to account for many of the geologic formations, may quite possibly suffice not only to account for the deposition of the rocks and organisms in their usual sequences, but also for occasional de deposits in unusual orders. Water comes by, slams together, formation. So more water comes by, slams together, another formation. They appear to be out of order, but it's a catastrophic water that, uh, in a worldwide flood that creates this order, not evolution over long periods of time for animals that became extinct. For in spite of all the devices which are available for harmonizing the contradictory cases with the accepted system of, of geology, there still exist many examples which seem much more difficult to explain in terms of uniformity and evolution than in terms of creation and subsequent catastrophes. Robin S. Allen says, Another biblical implication of the flood account is that great numbers of living creatures must have been entrapped and buried in the swirling sediments. Under ordinary processes of nature as now recurring, fossils, especially of land animals and even marine vertebrates, are, are very rarely formed. It's only the only way that they can be preserved long enough from the usual processes of decay, scavenging, and disintegration is by means of quick burial in aqueous sediments. William J. Miller, Emeritus Professor of Geology, UCLA, points this out. Comparatively few remains of organisms now inhabiting the Earth are being deposited under conditions favorable for their preservation as fossils. It is nevertheless remarkable that so vast a number of fossils are embedded in the rocks, but we can't see the present evidence of that. That the rock formations of the Earth are veritably rich in fossils is a fact hard to reconcile with the paucity of potential fossils being formed under present conditions. Geologists sometimes speak of the incompleteness of the fossil record, but this is only because of the absence of the anticipated missing links and the supposed evolutionary consequences of development. There is an abundance of fossils known of all kinds of creatures. Practically all modern families and most genera are represented in the fossil record, as well as the great numbers of extinct creatures. An outstanding Swedish scientist, late director of the Botanical Institute in Lund, Sweden, says, It has been argued that the series of paleontological finds is too intermittent, too full of missing links, to serve as a convincing proof. <clears throat> if a postulated ancestral type is not found, it is simply stated that it has not so far been found. Darwin himself often used this argument, and in his time it was perhaps a little justifiable. But too many years have gone by, and it but has lost its value through the immense advances of paleobiology in the 20th century. The true situation is that those fossils have not been found which were expected. Just where new branches are supposed to fork off the main stem, it has been impossible to find the connecting types. So no more no missing, missing links so far. Dr. Goldschmidt, University of California, in spite of the immense amount of the paleontologic material and the extensive uh, ex existence of long series of intact strategic uh, stratigraphic sequences with perfect records for the lower categories, transitions between the higher and the higher categories are missing. He goes on to say the point to be made here is that the fossil deposits are very rich, both in numbers and variety, in spite of having yielded up very few, if any, forms that might be considered as transitional between distinct kinds of creatures, whether lying, living or distinct. The richness of the deposit fits well with the Genesis record of the character and magnitude of the Great Flood, but accords very poorly with the uniformitarian notion that the relatively quiescent sedimentary processes of the present day, forming almost no fossils, can account for the extensive fossil barren strata. It seems evident, therefore, that the major geological inferences that can be derived from the biblical record of the flood are in good agreement with the actual geological facts as seen in the field. But this does not mean, of course, that these facts have been thus reinterpreted. 
They had been rather been fitted as well as possible into the uniformitarian scheme of historical geology, which hasn't been proved. In fact, the sedimentary strata with their entombed fossils have been made the very basis of the system of interpretation. These rocks have been divided into chronologic sequences based on the types of fossils contained in them. The resulting false synthesis being the generally accepted geological ages, with the fossil sequences supposedly demonstrating the evolutionary history of life on the Earth. But Dr. Patton has a comment on this. Let's begin by looking at the geologic column, probably the most effective and persuasive argument made by evolutionists today. We're told that this is what you find when you dig, up, dig down in the Earth. Beginning with a quaternary up near the top, you find the modern animals, man and mammals. As you come further down to the Cretaceous, you find the dinosaurs. At the Triassic and the Permian, and you've got the reptiles in Pennsylvania, the amphibians, and finally down to the bottom to the Cambrian, which, according to the evolutionary prediction, should contain most of the single-cell organisms, when in fact you find virtually every animal phylum there, including the vertebrates. The biggest problem with this kind of representation is that you can't dig down into the earth and find it anywhere. You find it in the textbooks, but you don't find it in its complete form anywhere. Notice the statement by Leet and Judson in their book, Physiolo Physical Geology, a textbook I was taught from at two different states universities, because we find, we cannot find sedimentary rocks representing all of the earth. Okay, so that will, we'll work on this next time.